Да. الحمد لله رب العالمين وأفضل الصلاة وأتم التسليم على سيدنا ومولانا وحبيبنا وقرة أعيننا محمد النبي الأمي وعلى آله وصحبه ومن اهتدى بهديه إلى يوم الدين تركنا عن محجة البيضاء ليلها كنهارها لا يزيغ عنها إلا هالك ثم أما بعد all praises due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Lord and sustainer of all the worlds. We beseech and implore him to offer his manifest blessings and salutations upon his last and final prophet, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and upon his family, his kin, his companions, and all those who follow his guidance until the last day. He has left for us a clear, pristine path. It is day as in its night in its clarity, and no one will stray from it except fine perdition. So this is the Second session, inshallah, of uh, the class reading the Mukhtasar or the abridgment of Sayyidina al Imam al Bukhari, Muhammad Ismail al Bukhari, uh, and the abridgment by our Imam Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Abi Jamra, radiallahu anhum ajma'in. Uh, first off, I'd like to apologize for some confusion in the timing. Uh, I think we're in the season of, of time changes. So I think on the East Coast in the U.S. there was a, a revert back to a standard time and the week before that was the U.K. So there was some confusion about uh, what time it would be uh, Greenwich Mean Time versus the East Coast. And I, incidentally, I myself, I'm not even, I'm in Cairo right now in the U.K. Uh, this week. So the, uh, the whole time thing is a little bit confusing to me as well. But I think from here on out, uh, everyone is on standard time now. So it will be 4 p.m., uh, Eastern Standard Time and 9 p.m. Uh, Greenwich Mean Time and then whatever follows from that for people in uh, if there are people in Australia or Asia and so forth. So last week we offered a brief uh, introduction into the science of Hadith and we spoke a little bit about uh, some of the reasoning by which Imam al-Bukhari compiled his Sahih uh, we gave a little bit of a brief history about uh, hadith itself and about some of the great imams who were the first to compile collections of hadith amongst them Imam Malik and his Muwatta radiallahu anhu uh, and Imam Ahmad and his Musnad and also Imam Abu Hanifa and his Musnad as well but uh, during the time of Imam Bukhari which is some 70 or 80 years later he compiled his Sahih based upon a conversation he had with Ibn Rahawai as is narrated and related by Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani, where they said, why don't you, he was said to Imam Bukhari, why don't you compile a book uh, of just the Sahih Hadith, or the rigorously authenticated Hadith. And we mentioned a little bit about what Sahih means, or rigorously authenticated versus Hadith Hasan and Hadith Da'if, and that the two main criteria are ad uh, wal adl namely precision, uh, and trustworthiness and these are the two main criteria for looking at the individual narrators or the ruwa uh, which is the plural of rawi of each hadith so that all of everyone in the chain of transmission going back to the prophet وسلم, must be what we call thiqa or someone who is impeccable in both their precision in narrating hadith as well as in their uh, trustworthiness and the science of, of classifying and categorizing the uh, men and women of hadith, the narrators, it's called ilm al-rijal or the science of men even though it includes both uh, men and women and sometimes it's also referred to as ilm al-jarh wa ta'adil uh, al-jarh means uh, to find fault with something and al-ta'adil means to find it to be trustworthy so uh, we can inshallah begin if anyone has any questions about uh, anything that transpired last week or if you missed some of the sessions or you missed last week's session, I believe it will be rebroadcast at a later date, inshallah, but we can save uh, anything dealing with that till the end of uh, this session, uh, inshallah. So the first hadith uh, that Imam Ibn Abu Jamr includes in his Mukhtasar is what's referred to as Hadith Bad Il Wahi, or the hadith describing the beginning of revelation. 
And if we recall from last week, we said that uh, Imam Ibn Abu Jamra, Ibn Abi Jamra uh, called or named his Mukhtasar Jab'un Nihaya fi bad'il khayri wa ghaya, wal ghaya. So the, the Jama of compiling of the end of things, fi bad'il khayri, in the beginning of good things, bad'il khayr, and we see that the bad'il khayr, the beginning of all good, came with the coming of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam wal ghaya, and the ghaya being that which we look forward to or the, the goal, the target at the end which is dukhul al-jannah ja'al Allahu min ahliha ajma'in may Allah make us from the dwellers of paradise insha'Allah so the last hadith included in the Muqtasar which is the 296th hadith is the hadith of dukhul ahl al-jannah or people entering paradise and insha'Allah it's our intention to read uh, all of these nearly 300 hadith uh, during these classes. I did have some discussion with uh, the administrators of Seekers Guidance and what we're going to try to do hopefully is divide the uh, the reading of these 300 hadith into core segments so that they're more manageable for people uh, inshallah. So look to hear about that I think inshallah in the coming uh, short period of time if not days. So and as we mentioned, Ibn Abu Jamra also includes only the Rawi of the Hadith or the Sahabi who directly uh, narrates the Hadith. And I should mention that by Ijma' of the consensus of the ulama, all of the Sahaba are Udul or all of the Sahaba are uh, impeccable in their trustworthiness. And this is based upon the Hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Nujum, bi ayyihim iqtadaytu mahtadaytu my uh, sahab, my companions are like the stars whichever one of them you choose to follow you will be guided and so the companions being also the khulafa being the uh, the rightful uh, successors to the Prophet Sallallahu they are the ones who carried this if this inheritance to us from the Prophet Sallallahu so if we can't trust them then there's really no one that that we can trust uh, and of course some of the Sahaba were more prolific in their narration of hadith based most likely on access that they had to the Prophet Sallallahu So amongst the most prolific was Abu Hurairah even though he came uh, later and did not join uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi until later in uh, his mission in Medina but he was someone who is described as having mulazana with the Prophet Sallallahu He was with him at his side, he served him. Uh, similarly, Anas ibn Malik was also one of those type of Sahabi, and of course, uh, the wives of the Prophet Sallallahu and the most prolific uh, female narrator of hadith, and also the prolific in terms of being amongst his wives, was Aisha, radiallahu anha, the, uh, the beloved wife of the Prophet Sallallahu who was also the daughter of uh, Abu Bakr, radiallahu anhu, the first Khalifa of Islam after the Prophet Sallallahu So, and Imam uh, narrates here عن عائشة أم المؤمنين رضي الله عنها أنها قالت So he narrates on the authority of Aisha and here she, des she is described as Um المؤمنين or the mother of the believers and this was an epitaph or a, a nomenclature that was used for all of the wives of the Prophet Sallallahu and this is uh, based upon the hadith and the ayat that uh, delineate the wives of the Prophet Sallallahu as Ummahat al mumineen as mothers of the believers. And in Surah Al-Ahzab, it's revealed that the wives of the Prophet Sallallahu are not to marry anyone uh, after the Prophet Sallallahu So that's a hukum or a ruling that's khas or specific to them. Uh, additionally, they are like mothers to the believers in that sense and that they are forbidden for one to marry after the Prophet ﷺ, but they are not like mothers in the sense that uh, the al uh, sharia is allowed or to be alone in that sense or uh, uh, to treat as a mother to see without hijab and so forth. In fact, uh, also Surah Al-Ahzab it's mentioned that the wives of the Prophet ﷺ or Ummahat al muminin are not to be seen except min wara hijab, except from behind a barrier and that was also something specific to them but nonetheless as I mentioned Aisha was amongst the most prolific of the hadith narrators and I think I believe she is uh, 
second overall after Abu Hurairah in terms of the compilation of Imam al-Bukhari. So that did not stop her from narrating uh, many hadith to herself. And in fact, she was a muhadditha. She was someone who is known as a scholar of hadith and also a faqiha, also someone who is uh, uh, someone who is trained and well versed in jurisprudence or fiqh. So they came to her and, they, and many of the tabi'een, those that came after, studied with uh, our mother uh, Sayyidatul Aisha radiallahu anha. So Umm al-Mu'mineen radiallahu anha, may Allah be pleased with her. Again, the uh, taraddi would be the verbal noun of radiall, when you say radiallahu anhu, when you, and it's actually a dua. You're asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be pleased with the person that you're mentioning. So technically speaking, you could say, Fulan, my sister or my brother, someone living amongst us now, radiallahu uh, anhu. But al-mustalah alayhi, in other words, what has been normally accepted in terms of terminology, is that radiallahu anhu is generally used for the Sahaba. Generally used for the, uh, the Sahaba or the companions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa we would say, taraddi. And that uh, salat was salam, is generally used for the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, and as well as uh, the other Prophets uh, uh, such as uh, Sayyidina Isa, Jesus and Moses and Nuh and Ibrahim and Dawood and Sulaiman and the rest of them that are mentioned uh, in the Quran. Some of them also mentioned that the uh, uh, for the Prophets besides the Prophet وسلم, if they are mentioned singularly, in other words not in the same breath as the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu then we would just say Alayhi Salam. So if I'm just saying, uh, speaking about the Prophet Musa, I would say Sayyidina Musa Alayhi Salam. But if I were speaking about both Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and Musa in the same breath, then I would say Sayyidina Muhammad wa Sayyidina Musa Alayhim, both of them as salat was salam. Oh, you would say uh, Sayyidina Musa Alayhi uh, Alayhi wa ala Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam or some other sila or, or reference of this sort. And the second part of that, radiallahu anhu or alayhi salatu wa salam or rahimahullah, um, technically in the Arabic grammar, these are, are what are called jumal um, khabariya. Uh, in other words, they are, are, are sentences that re reflect uh, a particular occurrence or happening or a fact. And the other type of jumla in terms of this categorization is jumla uh, uh, istifhamiya or jumla ta'ajubiya or any of the other type of jumla that are not necessarily uh, claiming something because they define in jumla khabariya or the sentence that's claiming something, something that can either reflect truth or falsehood. So if I were to say uh, Zaid is six feet tall this is what's called the Jumla Khabariya. So either Zayd is actually six feet tall or he's not. Um, versus where, it, if I were to ask a question or I were to command to something, if I said, how tall is Zayd? It's not a sentence that can reflect either truth or falsehood because it's asking for something. Or if I tell Zayd, sit down. Uh, again, it's not something reflecting truth or falsehood. So radiallahu anhu or anha, or alayhi salatu was salam, even though it's jumla khabariya uh, in its grammatical form, the meaning is uh, uh, a jumla, uh, what they say, a jumla that's asking for dua. So it's making a dua. So literally it means Aisha uh, umul mu'mineen, Allah is pleased with her or has been pleased with her. So I'm not affirming that fact, but in fact I am asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make dua for that. So when I say Fulan rahimahullah, uh, Allah has His mercy upon His soul. I'm asking the action Allah, asking Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, to have mercy upon His soul. And someone who's not familiar with the Arabic language will become confused by this. And I've actually heard people occasionally. Uh, I recall one occasion in the masjid where I, I walked in and I saw a people, a group of people arguing. And I said, "What are you arguing about?" They said, "This rahimahullah, are we allowed to say that because we're." We're actually affirming uh, rahma or uh, mercy for someone who has passed on. We don't really know if Allah Subhanahu wa Taala has actually, you know, entered them into paradise or has done something else with them. So, you know, that's something where, where people can get confused about their deen because they haven't really actually taking it from the uh, hearts and, and, and mouths of the ulama.
So inshallah protects us from, from that type of confusion. So she narrates the hadith and then she says قالت, So she is narrating the hadith. أول ما بدأ به رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم من الوحي الرؤية الصالحة في النوم. So she says the first thing that was begun with the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam from wahi, from revelation or here the from could be tab'idiyya from means from amongst the types of revelation he received was ar-ru'ya saliha or the, uh, the true dream or it could mean uh, the wahi that was ar-ru'ya saliha or tafsiriyya it's explaining to us what type of revelation it is finnom so here she said finnom while he's asleep because it's possible to have a, a vision, a beatific vision, uh, while one is awake, as well as one being asleep. But she was very specific here and said while he was asleep. And wahi, uh, linguistically it means uh, a type of what they say, ishara al-khafiyya, or to give sort of a, a subtle signal about something. So if I was just speaking in a purely linguistic, linguistic sense, I would say, Fulan awha ila fulan and uh, and yakhruj, you know the person he uh, he signaled to him you know sort of with his a hand gesture or in a subtle manner, you know it's time to leave or it's time to come in or something of that sort. But wahi in the, uh, in the terminology of the Quran of the Ulama means khitab uh, rabbani. Uh, it means a a divine uh, message given to a prophet or a messenger. And of course, the difference between Prophet and Messenger is that they have in common that both of them receive wahi, both are recipients of wahi or revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that which is different is that the Messenger is then uh, commanded to convey that wahi, is commanded to relay that wahi, that message to uh, the people around him, to the people in general. Whereas the Nabi uh, is, or the Prophet is not necessarily uh, commanded to convey the message uh, to people after him, but nonetheless he receives the wahi. Uh, and so even there were some, there are a few different opinions, for example, about uh, Sayyidah Maryam uh, alayhi salam, if she was actually uh, merely a Siddiqa, as is mentioned in one of the ayahs of the Qur'an, a Siddiqa, yani someone who has reached the maqam of Siddiqiyya, or the maqam of, of true uh, uh, truthhood, so to speak, uh, in the uh, in her in her station, or she was beyond that, and she was actually a prophet, but not a messenger. And Imam Al Qurtubi mentions this opinion in his tafsir. Of course, the Jumhur opinion, the majority opinion, is that she was not a prophet, but there were some of the ulama that did say that she she indeed was a prophet, but not a uh, a messenger. Wallahu a'lam bissawab. Allah knows that which is correct. So, uh, she speaks about uh, al-wahi, and al-wahi can come in different forms. Here, it's talking about one particular form. Uh, we'll actually, in the hadith, we'll see two, two forms of wahi. The first we're encountering here, and the second we'll encounter a little bit later on. But Imam al-Bayhaqi, mentions there are eight forms of wahi, amongst them being the uh, the true dream, amongst them being ilqa' uh, wahi bidun hijab, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can actually convey the revelation in a matter of different forms. Uh, this is mentioned in some of the other hadith of Bukhari and Muslim, such as mithl salat al-jaras, yani a type of uh, strong ringing that comes to the Prophet sallallahu in another hadith he mentions that this uh, this was the most severe type of wahi that he received and it would be mentioned how he would, he would his forehead would uh, beam with, with sweat because of the, uh, the difficulty when receiving this type of wahi and when he received this type of wahi if he was mounted uh, on a mount like a camel or a horse he would have to get down because of the thithan or the heaviness of this form of wahi would be too much for the animal to bear um, and then other forms of wahi that the malak or the uh, angel Jibreel alayhi salam can actually come in the form of a man as we see later in this hadith and relate the revelation to 
the Prophet Sallallahu or he can actually come in his true form uh, and also relate the uh, the wahi or the message to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam or the wahi could be in the form that as that happened between Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala when he gave wahi to Sayyidina Musa uh, Prophet Moses Alayhi Salam which was uh, kalam bidun sawt a type of speech that happened without uh, a type of sound and Allah Alam Allah only Allah knows the, the true nature of how that wahi that wahi or that revelation transpired but we know that it transpired nonetheless because the Quran very clearly states wa kallam Allahu Musa taklima wa kallam Allahu Musa taklima and here Allah spoke to Musa and then the uh, the masdar or the verbal noun that comes after taklima is a, a what we call a, a ta'kid or something that confirms the meaning so it's not something that happened necessarily metaphorically it happened in a way but in a way that uh, the, the human understanding cannot arrive at. Wallahu a'lam. So, al-ru'ya, al-saliha fin no. So, al-saliha, or the right or the true dream uh, in the sleep. And then she explains more about the nature of these dreams. فتقول, so she says, فَكَانَ لَا يَرَى رُؤْيَا إِلَّا جَاءَتْ مِثْلَ فَلَةَ الصُّبْحِ So it would come, فَكَانَ لَا يَرَى He would not see the ru'ya, he would not see this vision in the dream. إلا جاءت except that it would come مثل like فلة الصبح like the the day break in Arabic language uh, this particular linguistic device is called تشبيه or the closest thing in English would be simile so it's coming like something so like the day break uh, then one would ask in what sense like the day break and this is left for the reader to discern and that's one of the uh, the uh, the beauties, uh, beautiful things about the Arabic language, is that uh, oftentimes what is not said, what is not mentioned, is more emphatic uh, and perhaps even more uh, metaphorical than what is actually being said, uh, what is mentioned. So sort of reading between the lines, and it's left to the cognizant reader or the the listener to discern what that means. So here the ulama tell us that. مثل فلة الصبح like the daybreak in its clarity so daybreak uh, just when the sun is about to rise is clear uh, in a sense that it's clear wadah very visible uh, easy to be seen and so the uh, imma they mentioned that the Prophet وسلم, would see his dreams in his dreams like what would happen the next day particular events that would transpire and then they would be as he saw in his dream and this actually uh, took place for six months prior to this so for six months the Prophet Sallallahu would see dreams or, and uh, the next day they, the events that transpired in the dream they would actually transpire in real life according to what he saw in his dream now the interesting thing here is that uh, we also heard from uh, directly from our uh, our Shaykh Shaykh Ali Jum'ah Hafizahullah may Allah preserve him the Grand Mufti of Egypt is that these uh, these six months if we look to the hadith that uh, al sadiqa juz'un right is a part of uh, 46 parts of nubuwa and this is one of the hadith Imam al-Bayhaq he mentions in Kitab Shu'ab al-Iman when he talks about the, uh, the, the uh, branches of faith so if we looked to the number 46, one might ask, well, why 46? Well, if we say that the Prophet's mission was 23 years, 13 uh, in Mecca and 10 in Medina, and that he saw his Ru'ya Saliha, the true dream, for six months, then in terms of the time period, six months is actually 146 of, uh, uh, of that period of time since he lived for uh, 23 years. Wallahu a'lam. So it could actually you know, reflect the, uh, the, the length of time, the amount of time that he was seeing that true dream. And uh, part of the hikmah or the, the uh, wisdom behind the Prophet ﷺ receiving this particular form of wahi before anything else is that it was sort of a tamheed or preparation for other types of wahi that would be uh, uh, more overbearing for him to, to deal with. So this was an early indication that he would be receiving uh, revelation from God from 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then Sayyidah Aisha anha continues and she says, ثُمَّ حُبِّبَ إِلَيْهِ الْخَلَاءِ وَكَانَ يَخْلُوا بِغَارِ حِرَاءٍ فَيَتَحَنَّثُ فِيهِ وَهُوَ التَّعَبُّدُ الْلَّيَالِيَ ذَوَاتِ الْعَدَدِ قَبْلَ أَنْ يَنْزِعَ إِلَىٰ أَهْلِ وَيَتَزَوَّدُ لِذَلِكِ ثُمَّ حُبِّبَ إِلَيْهِ الْخَلَاءِ Then it was made beloved to him al khala which is very similar to the word khalwa, which means uh, isolation. So isolation, or being apart from the people, was made beloved to him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And so the, the verb form used here, hubbiba, it's a passive voice. So it's not said, who made that beloved to the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It also indicates it's not something that he sought or looked for him, was looking for himself, but rather this was something could have been also in addition to a form of ilham or inspiration that Allah put in the heart of the Prophet Sallallahu that he loved the uh, or was made beloved to him to, to seek refuge or to seek isolation uh, at certain times, not in, 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 a, in a permanent basis, but at certain times from being amongst people. And lest we forget, we know that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam before his nubuwa, before uh, this day when he received his first wahi and, and his prophethood was confirmed, uh, lived amongst the mushrikeen or the polytheists in Quraysh and they are the ones who put some 360 odd idols uh, in the Kaaba and it was narrated that some of them even would circumambulate the Kaaba uh, uh, naked and they are the ones who uh, you know had their nawadi or had their gatherings of, of drinking and vice and so forth and so the Prophet ﷺ was still on his fitra and Allah SWT protected him from all of those and so oftentimes when we find ourselves in a situation where uh, either being amongst vice and iniquity or being by oneself, then obviously the better choice is to be by oneself. And there are also other fawaid, there are other uh, benefits to uh, occasional uh, khala or khalwa or a'tizal or uzla. These are all very similar words uh, to be away from uh, others. Uh, for a certain time and the better way to look at it is that one is being away from others not for the harm that they can do to you but rather for the harm that you can do to them otherwise if you go in with an attitude I'm going to leave the people and you know they're just too much and uh, I don't want to deal with them anymore and they are troublesome and bothersome and I'm better off by myself and so forth then uh, you're entering not as a humble servant but you're entering as uh, an arrogant person um, so, and that is how the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam entered into his khalwa. Remember, even though he was, on occasion, would go to Ghar Hira, as we'll see, to the cave of Hira in Jabal al-Nur, the mountain of light, he nonetheless was uh, amongst uh, his, his kinsmen uh, and his clansmen in Quraysh. And he was known as an Amin. He was known as the trustworthy one to the extent that they would leave their uh, holdings and their treasures and their savings with the Prophet Sallallahu and even they left it with him right up until he made his hijrah to Al Medina and he uh, deputized Sayyidina Ali radiallahu anhu to uh, disperse the wada'a or to disperse the uh, the holdings that he was holding for people before even uh, Sayyidina Ali he himself would make his own hijrah so that clearly indicates that uh, he was not someone who, who who left his people and also uh, did not take part in, in their affairs. And also when he was uh, five years before this happened, when he was about 35, he was the one who placed Al-Hajar Al-Asad or Hajar Al-Aswad in its uh, proper place in, in the corner of the Kaaba when the different sub-tribes of, of Quraysh were quarreling over who would be the one to place the Hajar or the rock of uh, uh, Hajar Al-Aswad in the, in the Kaaba and they mentioned that the first person to walk in next to the Haram, he will be the one who will decide. And it was none other than uh, Sadiq al Amin who walked in, and then he was the one who had them take a, a rectangular blanket and they all carried it. And then he, it was his noble hand وسلم, that actually placed it in the uh, proper place in the, uh, in the Kaaba. And this was after the Kaaba was rebuilt uh, during that time.
But as it said here, ثم حبنا إليه خلاء. So he would on occasion, he would seek some isolation. وكان يخلو بغار حراء فيتحنث فيه. And so he would go to the cave of Hira, and there he would seek. Uh, and the word that's used, فيتحنث. Uh, and tahannuth is not a word that's actually very common that you find being used uh, for ibadah, uh, for devotion. And even the uh, the next phrase, وَهُوَ taabud, and it is taabud, and it is devotional worship, or it is worship. Uh, the Urwat, uh, or the, uh, the uh, narrators of the hadith mentioned that this wasn't actually from the kalam or the the text of Aisha, but it was kalam from the Rawi above her, which is uh, Az-Zuhri. Wallahu a'lam. Because it's a tafsir, it's describing what does tahannuth mean. It means uh, ta'abud. And possibly uh, the word tahannuth was as, was as a word was used for something that indicated ibadah before the Sharia of Islam came about. So there was a certain type of ibadah that was performed before the Sharia of Islam that has Salat and uh, Zakah, fasting and paying Zakah and Hajj, uh, even though Hajj was there beforehand. Um, and the specific attribute of the Tahannath or the Ibadah, the worship of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi is not really known. There are some different uh, possible explanations about what he actually uh, did up there. Some of them said that he actually um, prayed in a manner or similar to the last prophet before him, what was namely uh, Isa alayhi salam, or in a manner similar to Musa alayhi salam, or to Ibrahim alayhi salam. But again, uh, it's not known exactly which. And so when something is not known about a particular ruling, uh, then the ulama have a, have a mustalah, have a term for this, and they call it al-waqf. And waqf means, yani taqaf, you stop and you say, I don't know. So when they say it could be this way, or it could be a second way, and then the third one is al-waqf, means it's something that's not actually known. Uh, for example, uh, alhamdulillah, we just uh, celebrated Eid al-Adha uh, these past few days, and in terms of the dhabih of the person or the son, which of the sons was it that Ibrahim alayhi salam was commanded to sacrifice? Was it the older son Ishaq, who was the uh, his son from Sarah alayhi salam, or was it from Hajar, uh, Ismail alayhi salam? And so there are different opinions. Uh, many of the ulama said Sayyidina Ismail. Some of the ulama, amongst them are Imam Malik anhu, said it was Sayyidina Ishaq. And then the third opinion is that at tawakuf or to say, we can't be sure. It was one of the two, but we don't know which one. The Quran didn't specifically say which one, it just said his son. So here the tahannuth is something that, uh, very in terms of its specificity, we can't really say. And then he, she describes what uh, ta'abud, or it is devotional worship, and it's worshiping. Uh, nights, or several nights, or many nights, and the Prophet Sallallahu would go for for uh, at, up to a maximum of thirty nights or a month at a time before returning back to his family. Before he returns to his family, and then yatazawad, which means to take his zad or to take his uh, provision to go back to the Ghar of Hira. Now, those of you who have had the good fortune of being to Umrah or Hajj and being to Mecca, many of you may have actually went up to uh, the uh, Lagar Hira itself uh, to try to see it. And it's a little bit of a trek to get up to the mountain, but it's, of course, it's quite well worth the, uh, the trouble. But one may ask, why this particular place? You know, of all of the places the Prophet ﷺ could seek isolation, Mecca is a... Is a a valley sur surrounded by several mountains, amongst them Jabal al uh, Why this particular place did the Prophet Sallallahu choose this? Uh, Imam Ibn Jamra, he says that when uh, the Prophet Sallallahu chose this place, it gave him the ability to actually see Al-Bayt, Al-Bayt al-Haram, or to see the Kaab from that vantage point. And so, when he was worshipping Allah Subhanahu wa Taala from this place, he actually had three separate ibadah in one. 
the first being uh, al-khalwa because al-khalwa itself in of itself uh, seeking isolation to uh, for teskiyah for improving uh, oneself and for purifying one's soul is a type of ibadah it's a type of uh, devotional act and second secondly the tahannuth or the the abud itself is also an ibadah whether he was doing praying or dhikr or remembering allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that's also a type of ibadah of course and then the third and nadar ilal al bayt and nadar ilal al bayt is a type of ibadah so looking at the kaaba is a type of ibadah and so the beautiful thing about our deen is that we can actually look at certain things and we can count them amongst ibadah many people you know we also const or we frequently concentrate on all of the things we're not supposed to look at uh, and ghadd al-basar of course is uh, or lowering one gaze is, is, is matlub it's, it's something that has to be done but there are also certain things that when we do look at them they are in and of themselves a type of ibadah amongst them looking at the Kaaba. Uh, Bayt al-Haram and, and gazing upon it is a type of ibadah looking at the face of one's parents as mentioned by many of the ulama is also a type of ibadah and looking at them with nadhat al-shafaqa uh, wal mahabba a of uh, look of compassion and of uh, love is a type of ibadah looking at wajh al-alim looking at the, the countenance or the face of an alim of a scholar or of a righteous person, a righteous soul, is also a third form of ibadah that is just dealing with uh, nadar. Looking at the pages of the mushaf when reading the Qur'an, you know, some of them uh, debated which is superior, to read the Qur'an from memory or to read the Qur'an looking at the leaflets of the mushaf or the, the book itself. And some of them mentioned that it's superior to look at, to read from the mushaf if it's not in terms of, of, of uh, one doesn't have the intention, one has merely the intention of ibadah, not the intention of strengthening their memorization or memorizing, it's superior because you're also involving nadhara, you're also involving looking at the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the page, and that too is an ibadah in addition to the actual recitation of the Quran, which is also a type of ibadah, which is also a type of uh, devotional act. So, uh, he would spend up to 30 nights or 30 nights and days in Ghar Hira and then she said after that he would go back to his family Ahlihi and Ahl here is to reflect uh, going back to Sayyidah Khadija anha, who was his wife and his only wife at the time and his children as well uh, to see them and the word Ahl which is Hamza ha Lam is, is a word that's actually used for family in general, also to speak about uh, one's wife, uh, even though you find that some of the hadith uh, is zawja, can also mean wife or zawj, but oftentimes the word ahl can denote even just the wife. And then he seeks his provision and then goes back. And here the seeking uh, provision aspect is important because one might say, well, he's a Prophet. If he wanted provision, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can give him provision when he's in the mountain. And he won't have to go back. And we read, you know, many stories that uh, some of them married in uh, Risal al-Qushayriya, the epistle of Imam al-Qushayri, and other stories that talk about al-Saliheen, of how many of them would trek in the desert for days, if not months and years, without any sort of provision. Uh, one thing that we should keep in mind is that the Prophet uh, always saw a middle, moderate path, he is someone who is leaving an, an example and a legislator for others to follow after him. And secondly, uh, there are certain stories that we might read uh, about such people who do what seem to be uh, superhuman acts. And the, uh, the attitude that we should have with such things is a tasneem. You know, we should acquiesce to them and accept them. But we don't necessarily have to emulate them, or nor we ask to emulate them. Because there are certain types of people who may be in of themselves of amongst the awliya of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but they're the type of awliya that not necessarily are to be emulated. And then there are other types of awliya and other types of salihin, and, and of course the ulama, who leave an example for us. So the best example is the example of the Prophet. And even uh, Shaykh. 
Ibn Abi Jamr, he narrates uh, in his exp explanation of this hadith that there was uh, one of the ulama who seemingly would go days on end without having to eat anything. And his students, his disciples, saw him do doing this. But every night he would have a loaf of bread that he'd always place under his pillow, under his mattress, that he always put there. And so they decided, well, he's not really in need of that, so they, they took it away from him. And so the, uh, one night they heard like a scream, and the, uh, the sheikh actually rebuked them. And he said, why did you take away that loaf of bread under my uh, pillow? They said, sheikh, you, you're not in need. We see that you're not even eating from it. And then he said to them, you think my station, my hal, where I'm at, is something I've done myself or I've brought about myself? It is only from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so the adab, the, uh, the proper form with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is to uh, respect al-asbab, is to have uh, uh, ihtiram and respect of the physical causes that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He is the one who put them here. He is the one who has made them manifest. So we respect them, we have ihtiram for them without having ta'alluq with them, without having a uh, strong bond and connection with them in the sense that we then become reliant upon them. We only are supposed to be reliant on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but we have ahtiram, a respect for the asbab or for the uh, physical causes that are there. And so going back to the Prophet for he seeks and takes his provision. This is part of adab ad ad in asbab. So even if you are a person who can perform uh, saintly miracles and karamat, it still behooves one to not to make a claim, right? Because when you go out somewhere and you have nothing and you have taken nothing of provision, and you just say, well, you know, Allah will make something happen, and you have the ability to, to seek that provision, then this is what's called iddi'a. It's like making a false claim. And then, you know, they say, be, be aware or, uh, uh, of the, uh, or be cautious about the false claims of the Sufis, or some of the Sufis, yeah, to be those who make claims, one should be careful with because the true Sufi or the true Wali or the true Salah won't make claims. And then he would return to Khadija anha, and get seek his provision to another 30 day period or so, a 30 night period, until until the truth came to him in Ghar Hira. So here the truth means the matter that is truthful, in other words, the revelation that came to the Prophet. And then the Malak or the angel came to him. And the word Malak is very similar to the word Malik. Uh, Malak with Fatha on the lamb means angel. And Malik with Kasra means king or sovereign, as in uh, in the dunya. And so uh, some of them say that Al A'la Al A'la Al Asfal Al Asfal. So the higher, namely the Fatha, which comes on top of the lamb, is for the higher form, which is the angel. And then the Kasra, which comes underneath the lamb, is for the lower form, which is the worldly king. فجاءه الملك, in other words, Jibreel, alayhi salam, فقال, اقرأ. So he said to him, recite or read. قَالَ مَا أَنَا بِقَارِئِ قَالَ And here this is the Prophet ﷺ speaking. فَأَخَذَنِي فَغَطَّنِي حَتَّى بَلَدَ مِنِّي الْجُهْدَ أَوْ الْجَهْدَ Both the riwayahs are there. ثُمَّ أَرْسَلَنِي فَقَالْ إِقْرَأْ فَقُلْتْ مَا أَنَا بِقَارِئِ فَأَخَذَنِي فَغَطَّنِي ثَانِيَةَ حَتَّى بَلَدَ مِنِّي الْجَهْدَ ثُمَّ أَرْسَلَنِي فَقَالْ إِقْرَأْ فَقُلْتْ مَا أَنَا بِقَارِئِ فَأَخَذَنِي فَغَطَّنِي الثَّالِثَةَ ثُمَّ أَرْسَلَنِي فَقَالَ إِقْرَأْ بِاسْمِ رَبِّكَ الَّذِي خَلَقَ خَلَقَ الْإِنسَانَ مِنْ عَلَقٍ إِقْرَأْ وَرَبُّكَ الْأَكْرَمُ الَّذِي عَلَمَ مِنْ قَلَمٍ عَلَمَ الْإِنسَانَ مَا لَمْ يَعْلَمْ which is not part of the hadith but it was actually revealed uh, those first five areas uh, at this particular time so many of us of course are familiar with uh, what happened next when Jibreel alayhi salam who at this point came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam in the form of a man but remember that the Prophet ﷺ, this is years later, and he's actually narrating this to Aisha anha. So of course he had become well aware of what happened that day. So he said, فَجَاءَهُ الْمَلَكِ So the angel came to him. فَقَالْ إِقْرَأْ So he said to him, recite. And he said, مَا أَنَا بِقَارِئِ I am not one who recites. I am not a reciter. 
And one might ask if Jibreel alayhi salam is well aware of the Prophet's state, so I said, then why did he ask him to recite? And he knows that he is not able to, that he's an unlettered uh, Prophet. And so they say here that Iqra was meant, means to become prepared to read, become prepared to receive wahi, to receive uh, revelation. So then he took me, which means he, he held me or uh, then shook me. And then I was shaken until uh, it was as if Jibreel السلام, exerted all of his strength and energy in that shaking. And all of his strength and energy in the form that he was in the form of a man. Otherwise, if it was the form, his true form of an angel, it would have been made with too much to bear for any human being, perhaps even for the Prophet Sallallahu Then he let me go. And then he said a second time to read or recite. And then I stated the second time, Ma an Abi Qari, I am not one who reads or recites. And then he took me and shook me a third time in the same manner. And then uh, he did it a third time and I said the same thing back, Ma an Abi Qari. And then he let me go and then he revealed the first ayahs. Iqra' bism rabbika alladhi khalaq. Read in the name of your creator, the one who has created you. Khalaq al-insana min alaq. He has created the human being from a single blood clot. Iqra' wa rabbuka al-akram. Read and know that your Lord is the most generous or the most noble. So here, if we look to the beginning, back to the beginning of the hadith and what the Prophet ﷺ used to do, uh, he had hubb uh, ilayhi al-khala' It was made beloved to him the khala or to be in isolation or away from people or others for some period of time. And then uh, he had tahannuth during his khala or he had ibadah, devotional worship. During this time he was away. Uh, and then he also had al-ru'ya, al-saliha, right, which is the uh, true dreams. He would see something in a dream and then it would happen exactly in the manner that he saw in his dream the next day. And then came Jaa al haq or the, the matter of truth came to him in the revelation. So we see that there is tadarruj, there is a type of gradation here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala taking the Prophet وسلم, through these different degrees of qurb, these different degrees of closeness to the Prophet وسلم. And we know it ended up with uh, the, the closest that any human being or every human being will ever get to in terms of uh, uh, spiritual proximity to divinity, namely, وَكَانَ قَابَ قَوْسَيْنِ أَوْ أَدْنَى When he reached Sidratul Al-Muntaha on his Mi'raj, his heavenly ascension, and he was قَابَ قَوْسَيْنِ أَدْنَى and he was like a bow's width or less from uh, that uh, divine reality. So, we see that this tadarruj began with khala uh, or khalwa, some isolation from people, and also from tahannuth uh, and ibadah and then he was taken through the maqamat. Of course, uh, human beings besides the Prophet ﷺ will never reach the maqam of nubuwa, of prophethood, because prophethood is not earned, it is something that is bestowed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah a'lamu haythu yaj'alu risala. Allah a'lamu haythu yaj'alu risalata. Allah knows best where he puts his risala, to whom he will reveal it to. But other maqam, the maqam of Siddiqiyah or Wilayah are things that people, Muslims, uh, true believers can aspire to. And here in this hadith, we can take an example of how this happens via tadarruj, uh, via a gradation through different uh, spiritual stations. And the Prophet, وسلم, he has reported to have said, Addabani Rabbi fa ahsana ta'adibi. That my Lord is the one who has given me this adab. He has the one who has nurtured me, has raised me, and he has done the best in terms of nurturing and raising me, namely the Prophet. So the idea of ta'deeb, right? Ta'deeb means that you need to go through the paces, so to speak. You need to go through uh, the steps. Most people do. There are others who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he draws them close to him uh, without really a, a process of ta'deeb. But again, this is something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bestows upon whom he will. 
Nevertheless, uh, we see the example here for us. So when the Prophet ﷺ was taken and then uh, shook three times by the Archangel Jibreel ﷺ, the three times is also significant. Um, and we see that this idea of three is something that is repeated in the Sunnah. Many times when the Prophet ﷺ would explain something to uh, the Sahaba, he would mention it thrice, three times. When the man came to him and asked him, uh, Al-Sini, you know, give me a wasiyah, give me good advice. The Prophet ﷺ would tell him, La taqdab. And then he would say, Zidni, you know, give me something else. And then the Prophet ﷺ would attend the second time, say, La taqdab, do not become angry. And then the third time he would repeat, do not become angry. And so we see this often. Um, so it's mentioned uh, by some of our ulama, amongst them, uh, Sheikh Abdul Fatah Abu Ghudda Rahimahullah in his book uh, The Prophet uh, The Prophet as a Teacher or as Adib al Ta'deeb and Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam the ways by which the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to teach his people was that mentioning things uh, three times because it's said that the first time you hear something uh, you still may have been not quite ready prepared to hear it and so it's your initial reaction to it and then the second time, uh, you understand it. And then the third time you hear it, you commit it to, to memory and you actually digest it. So the idea of hearing something three times or going through something three times is, is significant. And we see that many of the ulama adopted this idea of uh, three times when uh, reading their notes, reading their durus to go over it three times and so forth. Allah. So he was shaken. Uh, three times and then finally Jibreel alayhi salam revealed the first wahi to him which was iqra bismi rabbika alladhi khalaq read in the name uh, of thy lord who has created you khalaq al insana min alaq the one who has created you from alaq as in the blood plot iqra wa rabbuka al akram and read and your lord is most noble most generous and so these first ayahs were revealed and the consensus of the ulama is that these were the very very first ayahs uh, of the Qur'an to be revealed to the Prophet ﷺ. Uh, some of the uh, tafsir mentioned uh, like Ya Ayyuha al-Muddathir which will come a little bit later was amongst the first to be revealed and some of them mentioned that Al-Fatiha was the first to be revealed. But to understand, because these are based upon narrations of the Sahaba, but to understand it, uh, when we have a hadith or akhbar, uh, when we have narrations that seemingly contradict each other, there are a couple of uh, devices, uh, there's a particular methodology that the ulama used to try to reconcile between them. And so the first thing they try to do is try to understand them according to their uh, meanings without having to actually use any type of, uh, without having to say that one is nasikh or mansuf, one is abrogated, or one is special or speaking about a specific group of people and one is more general, but to try to understand them in light of each other. And so with these particular uh, akhbar dealing with what was the first ayahs to be revealed, they said that Surah Al-Fatiha was the first complete uh, surah to be revealed, and it was revealed when the Prophet ﷺ, uh, at the same time that the uh, obligation for the five prayers were revealed still during Mecca. And that Ya Ayyuha al-Muddathir was the first to be revealed after what they called Fatrat al-Wahi, which was the, uh, the space between when the Prophet ﷺ first received the Wahi, the time period, and then when he received the second Wahi. And there's difference of opinion about how long that time period was, but there seems to be a general consensus that it was about three years. So from the time that the Prophet ﷺ reviewed this initial wahi here in Ghar Hira, upon his 40th birthday in Ramadan, the 16th of Ramadan, then uh, it was some three years later that he received the next part of the wahi, which comes at the end of this hadith, in, uh, uh, which was, Ya Ayyuha al-Muddakhir. فَرَجَعَ بِهَا So the next part of the hadith فَرَجَعَ بِهَا رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ يَرْجُفُ فُؤَادُهُ فَدَخَلَ عَلَى خَدِيجَةَ بِنْتُ خُوَيْلِدٍ فَقَالْ زَمُّنُونِي زَمُّنُونِي 
فزملوه حتى ذهب عنه الروع فقال لخديجة وأخبرها الخبر لقد خشيت على نفسي فقالت له خديجة كلا والله ما يخزيك الله أبدا إنك لتصر الرحمة وتحمل الكل وتكسب المعدوم وتقري الضيف وتعين على نوائب الحق فانطلقت به So here the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam goes back the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam goes back يرجف فؤاد in other words literally uh, shaking from the, uh, what the experience he had just experienced so then he entered upon Khadija bint Khuwailidin radiallahu anha, his wife and he said, Zamuruni, Zamuruni to her and whoever the members of the household, you know, cover me. And it was known that when someone is almost in a state of shock, that it's best to uh, cover them, to wrap them up in something. Fazamuruhu, so they wrapped him up, hatta dhahaba anhu until the, the initial shock of that experience had left. Then he spoke to Khadija, Khadija wa akhbarah al khabar. And then he spoke to her and here, Akhbar al Khabar, he told her exactly what was just mentioned in the beginning part of the hadith, what had happened to him. And then he said, Laqad khashitu ala nafsi. You know, I was worried about myself. And here, one might ask, what does it mean when the Prophet said he was worried about himself? What, what, what part is it that was worrying him? Um, remember that before this, the Prophet did see. Uh, the true dreams and he most certainly knew that that was not a normal occurrence that not everyone receives true dreams uh, and then sees them come to life as he saw them in their dream so that was an, an early indication that he was different and most likely he mentioned this also to Khadija and to others who were in his household so they had some idea so when he said لَقَدْ خَشِيتُ عَلَى نَفْسِي uh, Imam al-Shanawani, he says that he had a fear that maybe he would not be able to deal with what is happening to him. If this was really wahi and revelation, would he be strong enough to deal with it and to, to, uh, to be able to continue in this mission that Allah SWT has selected him for? Or that he was mutaraddid, he wasn't sure exactly what had happened. You know, that that person who came to him, was it actually an angel or was it something else? Uh, was it something of evil? So that's when Khadija radiallahu has said to him, Kalla wallah, ma yughziyak Allahu abada. She said, Kalla, yani impossible, no. And she swore by Allah, Allah will not uh, disappoint you, will not let you down or not uh, humiliate you. Why? And then she mentions a string of things that the Prophet Sallallahu practiced uh, in terms of his relationship with his kin and with uh, his neighbors and with others in Mecca. So the first she mentioned, in la tasiru rahim You know, you maintain your familiar familiar relationships. Ar-Rahim, tasiru rahim rahim means womb, but uh, literally, but here it means you maintain those who, uh, the relationship with those who are your family members. وَتَحْمِلُ الْكَلْ Right, and kel in Arabic means burden or a burdensome person or someone who is not able to meet their own needs. So tahmilu, so you you carry the burden of those who are not able to meet their needs. Wa taksibul madum, right, and also in madum or in muadim is someone who has nothing, not just doesn't have their needs, but they have nothing whatsoever, and so you also help those people. Wa taqri daif. And you are one who uh, uh, ennobles the, the, the guests when they come to the house. وَتُعِينُ عَلَى نَوَائِبِ الْحَقِّ And you provide succor and aid. نَوَائِب الْحَقِّ And نَوَائِب is the plural of the word نَائِبَ And نَائِبَ means something like of a, some type of calamity that befalls you or some type of... A, a, quarrel that you found yourself in or perhaps some type of feud and so وَتُعِينُ عَلَى نَوَائِبْ and حق. so the نَوَائِبْ that are حق that deserve to be you know one to get to interfere with and to provide aid for because remember uh, the tribes of Arabia at the time were, were uh, notorious for quarreling over what seemed to be the most trivial of affairs 
And so the Prophet ﷺ didn't get involved in those type of quarrels, but those that are nawaib al haq such as when they quarreled over where to put, who was to put the uh, black stone in the Kaaba. And so that was one example of Prophet ﷺ giving i'ana or giving aid and help to, to these situations. فَانْتَلَقَتْ بِهِ خَدِيجَةُ So then Khadija went with him. حَتَّى أَتَتْ بِهِ وَرَقَةَ إِبْنَ نَوْفِلْ إِبْنَ أَسَلٍ إِبْنَ عَبْدِ الْعُزَّى إِبْنَ عَمِّ خَدِيجَةَ وَكَانَ إِمْرَأً إِنْتَنَصَّرَ فِي الْجَاهِلِيَّةِ So, in order to further explore what had actually happened to the Prophet Wasallam, they went to وَرَقَةَ uh, إِبْنَ نَوْفَلْ Ibn Asad, Ibn Abdul Uz, Ibn, Ab, Ibn Am, so he was the cousin of Khadija radiallahu anha, direct cousin from her father's side. So her father and his father were, were brothers. And here it says he was a man, he became Christian in the uh, Jahiliyyah, and here Jahiliyyah just means the time prior to Islam, prior to the Prophet وسلم, his prophethood وكان يكتب الكتاب العبراني فيكتب من الانجيل بالعبرانيه ما شاء الله ان يكتب so he used to write hebrew or ibrani and he would write from the injil bilibraniya in hebrew uh, in a manner that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala provided for him وكان شيخا كبيرا and he was an older man قد عميا فقالت له خديجة. And he had became blind uh, later in life. Now here, uh, Warak ibn Nawfal becoming uh, Christian during the Jahiliyyah, or during the time prior to Islam, there were a group of Arabs in the peninsula who were not pleased with the general trend of polytheism taking root in the peninsula, as had happened in Mecca particularly, and some of the other areas uh, outlying areas in, uh, in, in Mecca and also Central Arabia in Najd and Eastern Arabia. Uh, and so they sought to practice the deen of Ibrahim alayhi salam, the true deen of Abraham alayhi salam. And he was known uh, uh, in the Arabian Peninsula because he had come there. He had, as we know, left uh, his wife uh, Hajar alayhi salam and Ismail in the uncultivated valley in Mecca and uh, that's when the Bani Jurhum or the tribe of Jurhum came and uh, gave them uh, abode and protection when they were in that uh, in Mecca and then Ibrahim alayhi salam later returned and built the Kaaba with the initial the first time at least in during that time period with uh, Ismail alayhi salam so they had knowledge of Ibrahim and even the polytheists of Quraysh and others, they claimed that they were practicing the faith of Ibrahim. Obviously, they were deluded in that claim, but nonetheless, that's what they claimed. But many of the uh, people of the Arabs in the peninsula, amongst them Abu Bakr Siddiq, for example, was never a polytheist. Uh, he was what was called a Hanif, someone who sought the true, pure monotheistic method, message of Ibrahim alayhi salam. So some of them. Uh, attempted to practice this monotheism in the best manner they could without associating partners with Allah SWT. Others uh, sought to seek others who practiced forms of monotheism. So some of them traveled north uh, to greater Syria where there were Christians or perhaps traveled south to the South Yemen where there also were some Christians. Um, and in the north it would be some Jews as well. So here when they say Tanassara he became Christian most likely because that he had some uh, some connection or some uh, exposure to Christianity as it was practiced in the uh, uh, northern uh, part of the peninsula or greater Syria at the time. And we should keep in mind that this was some 600 years or so uh, after Christ when even Christianity itself was still pretty much in its infancy. And many of the, uh, uh, of the commentators on this hadith, they say that uh, the likelihood is that Waraq ibn Nawfal was not from amongst the Christians who did tabdeel or who changed or who uh, veered away from 
the original message of Isa alayhi salam. In other words, most likely he did not consider Isa alayhi salam to be the son of God or to be divine in any way, but rather he considered him to be a prophet. So she nevertheless uh, it says here how he, he became well versed in even in Christianity because he was able to write in Hebrew. So this further clarifies or confirms that he had some uh, exposure to Christians uh, most likely from greater Syria and that he was an older man and he became blind in later life and then Khadija said to him Ya ibn Am, isma min ibn akhik you know, she said, my cousin listen to the son uh, of your brother which would mean your nephew and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi wasn't actually a direct nephew of Waraka he was more like a nephew four times removed but this was sort of a, a, a form of adab to address someone who was quite much younger than another to address them as one's nephew. فَقَالَ لَهُ وَرَقَ يَبْنَ أَخِي مَاذَا تَرَى So Waraka said to the Prophet uh, the son of my brother, my nephew, what do you see? So then the Prophet the Messenger of Allah explained فَأَخْبَرَهُ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ سَلَّمْ خَبْرَ مَا رَأَى what he saw. فَقَالَ لَهُ وَرَقَ هَذَا النَّمُوسُ الَّذِي نَزَّلَ اللَّهُ عَلَى موسى يا ليتني فيها جذعا ليتني أكون حيا إذ يخرجك قومك يخرجك قومك فقال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم أو مخرجيهم قال نعم لم يأتي رجل قط بمثل ما جئت به إلا عودي وإن يدركني يومك أنصرك نصرا مؤزرا ثم لم ينشب ورقة أن توفي وفطر الوحي فقال قال ابن شهاب the next hadith so we'll just finish this part here of uh, this hadith. So the Prophet ﷺ explained to him what had happened. Then Waraka said to him, هذا النموس, right? And namus here means a type of uh, uh, divine uh, spirit or divine revelation. And this was the word that Christians used to refer to Sayyidina Jibreel alayhi salam, namus. So they were referring to Jibreel. So he cl quite clearly understood that this was indeed an angel that came to the Prophet Sallallahu and it was the angel of revelation who is Jibreel alayhi salam. So he says, هذا النموس الذي نزل الله على موسى This is the namus or the same angel who came to Musa, to Moses alayhi salam. So he was able to identify that. And so this is one of the, uh, the points that they make in saying that uh, Waraq ibn Nawfal maybe had access to a type of Christianity that had not been perverted or had not been changed later on because obviously he understood the signs of the coming of the next prophet and then what he says next further gives further evidence to this when he says يَا لَيْتَنِي فِيهَا جَذَعًا لَيْتَنِي أَكُونُ حَيًّا إِذْ يُخْرِجُكَ قَوْمُ he said I wish I was much younger uh, I wish I would be alive when your people forcibly exile you and so he knew that uh, this was, uh, that Muhammad Sallallahu was a prophet, so that he must have known that there would be a prophet who would appear in the Arabian Peninsula with the muasafat or the attributes that the Prophet Sallallahu appeared with. And then he said something that puzzled the Prophet Sallallahu when he said, I wish I would be with you when your people forcibly exile you. فَقَالَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهِ The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi said, أَوَ مُخْرَجِيَهُمْ you know, this is a question, and they are going to force me to leave or to exile me. قال نعم. He said yes. لم يأتي رجل قط بمثل ما جئت به إلا عوديا. There has not been a man who has come with what you have you are coming with now, except that people made an enemy of him. وإن يدركني يومك أن صرك نصر مؤزرة. And if I were to live until that day, to your day, I would give you, uh, or I would help you in Surah uh, Nasran Mu'azzar, I, I would provide victory, or I would help you in your victory in a way that was uh, commensurate. ثُمَّ لَمْ يَنْشَبْ وَرَقَةُ أَن تُوفِيَ وَفَطَرَ الْوَحِي And then it was not uh, a long time before that Waraka uh, passed away and then the Wahi uh, stopped for a period of time and then returned. And then the next part of the hadith will explain the, uh, the second instance of wahi, as we mentioned, 
which according to different opinions, but uh, amongst of those opinions that three years later that the uh, Jibreel السلام, came to the Prophet the second time and received his second uh, revelation. So uh, inshallah we'll stop here because I think we've taken already over an hour. Uh, this was a long hadith, but uh, I don't think we've even covered really, we sort of just scratched the surface. surface. There was much to be uh, understood and learned from, from this hadith. Inshallah SWT will give us futuah, uh, uh, give us openings in, in understanding the, uh, the khitab of the Prophet وسلم, and in drawing closer to him and in being amongst those that uh, who are his companions and dwellers in paradise between Nahi Ta'ala. So if there are any uh, questions, we can have some minutes now to, to take those big ones. Uh, Brother Imran is asking, is it, accept, is it acceptable to say alayhi salam uh, upon Ahlul Bayt or others as Shia and some Sunnis do related to this? I have heard that in some manuscript of Sayyid Bukhari, the names of Ahlul Bayt do. As I said, it's, uh, it's something mustalah alayhi, it's something that's uh, it's a nomenclature commonly accepted that uh, there are different opinions, but uh, we can say that the uh, the jumhur or the majority opinion is that alayhi salat was salam, salah and salam is reserved for the Prophet when we're speaking about him by himself uh, or when we are mentioning him amongst others. So if we say the Prophet and his kin and his companions and those who follow his guidance, we say alayhi salat was salam, then that's something that's also uh, entirely acceptable. Uh, to mention uh, some of the names of the Bayt of uh, early Bayt of the Prophet وسلم, like Sayyidina Ali to say Sayyidina Ali alayhi salam la haraj it's not haram it's not uh, wrong or anything of this sort but as I mentioned the uh, the general practice is that Sahaba radiallahu anhum and for uh, for the Prophet وسلم, as salah was salam some of them also mentioned for Sayyidina Ali radiallahu anhu karram Allah wajha may Allah ennoble his face and it's narrated or related that this was ha happened during the time of Umar ibn Abdul Aziz because it was known that some of the uh, Imams prior to that when they would go to the Mimbar in uh, the time of Bani Umayyah they would uh, disparage Sayyidina Ali radiallahu anha so Umar ibn Abdul Aziz who is oft times considered the fifth righteous Khalifa he ordered the Imams to pronounce after mentioning Ali's name Karram Allah wajha May Allah ennoble his face, sort of as a counter to the uh, disparaging that had happened prior to that. Wallahu a'lam. Uh, brother is asking, I think, can you reiterate what benedictory phrases can be used with whom? Uh, just real briefly, as we said, Salatu wassalam for the Prophet wasallam, or others mentioned in the same breath. As salam for all other Prophets. التردي رضي الله عنهم for صحابة or for some of our uh, the مشتهد أئمز also رضي الله عنهم is actually it's it's, it's uh, more flexible could be used for besides the صحابة and for someone who has passed on generally you would say رحمه الله and for someone who we're speaking about who's still alive then you would say حفظه الله may Allah preserve them What can we come to understand about love by reflecting on the way people go through degrees of nearness unto him? For example, just a manifestation of his mercy or anything else? Well, everything is a manifestation of, uh, 
of Allah's mercy. But Allah's mercy is manifested in different ways. So even the, uh, the trials and, and fitan and mihan, tribulations that we're going through, are uh, examples of, of manifest, manifestation of that mercy. Because ultimately, they're supposed to bring you closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if a, a hardship succeeds in doing that, then it is, it is a form of mercy and it's actually uh, a blessing. Uh, and even Ibn Atta al Sakandari, he says that the uh, uh, that the naibat or the uh, or the uh, the fitan or the hard times are ayad al salihin, that they are the holidays or the uh, celebratory times of the salihin. Why? Because they have a better uh, grasp of. Uh, pertaining to, to their form and adab with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when they're in times of strife because it's generally easier to be sabr and patient than it is to be thankful when you have times of uh, favor and bounty. So ultimately uh, it is uh, manifestations of Allah's mercy and uh, in looking at that we should also keep in mind that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has also other attributes and that we need to know Allah by all of his attributes to be a, a complete Muslim or a complete human being. So, Shaykh Zarruq, uh, Ahmad Zarruq, for example, he mentions that uh, when Allah SWT gives you his ahkam, and what he means by ahkam means these decrees that happen to you that uh, you feel helpless to, uh, to deal with, as you should, then you return to Allah SWT and then you not only know him by his mercy, in times of plenty, but you also know him by his qahar, uh, by his qudra, his ability, his magnificence in times of hardship or trial. The next question. Uh, Regarding the delay between the first revelation and the next occurrence, what explanation is given to the Mu'allaq narration in Bukhari that the Prophet ﷺ thought of going off the mountain uh, without any, and it's, it's included in Mubara 40 Sira without any discussion of its meaning. Yeah, some of the Orientalists have picked up on, on this particular uh, narration that uh, the Prophet ﷺ nearly committed uh, suicide, a'udhu billah, and that's not true. Because um, there's a difference, even if we accept the Mu'allaf narration, it's not sahih, because he didn't include in the sahih uh, phraseology, but even if we accept it, um, then the way to understand it is that the Prophet Sallallahu merely uh, considered something, or the, the thought came, it was a khatira, as we say. Khatira means it was a, a fleeting thought that came about. But of course, uh, we know that prophets and messengers are sinless, both before Nubuwa, you know, before their prophet is confirmed, and both and after their prophet is confirmed, as is the consensus of the ulama. So yani, our, our madhab is Tanazzu and Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that we, that he uh, declare him to be innocent of such uh, type of, uh, of things attributed to him. And that we know that it was merely a, uh, a khatira and he actually didn't do it and didn't even try to do it. And we have to remember that uh, three years uh, between Wahi also was a difficult period for the Prophet Sallallahu if it was three years. And we know that Surah Duha addresses this a little bit. مَا وَدَّعَكَ رَبُّكَ وَمَا قَلَى Your Lord has not left you or has forsaken you. So this was sort of a, a tasliya or a, a softening uh, that came later for the Prophet ﷺ. Uh, the next question.
Did the Prophet Sallallahu have wisdom prior to becoming a Prophet? Where did he attain that wisdom prior to be a Prophet? Was it via traveling and speaking to others? This question comes from one of the professors from my university. Uh, the travel of the Prophet Sallallahu uh, prior to this was relegated to uh, only a few trips. One of them, when he made as a young child, when he was about 12, with his uncle, uh, Abi Talib, when they went to Syria. Uh, and even then, uh, uh, as the narrations go, that there was a cloud that followed the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam from there until they reached their destination. And even uh, uh, Al-Rahib, the, one of the monks in northern Syria, warned Abi Talib that, you know, to keep your son safe and not to bring him here again because the signs of Nabuwa are, are manifest and there might be people trying to want to hurt him as a result. But uh, nowhere do we have any indication that he had a sort of uh, connection with any men of or women of religion or of learning or of religious learning on, on those trips. The other trip that he made uh, was for on behalf of his, before she was his wife Khadija anha, as a merchant uh, to, uh, to uh, Syria and, and back. Uh, that being said, uh, we know that, as I mentioned earlier, the wahi comes in different forms. And so, uh, even before this incident, we said the wahi that came in the form of true dreams. And there could be a type of wahi or ilham or inspiration that includes hifd, which includes protection, preservation. So, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protected the Prophet sallallahu from the iniquities and from the vice uh, of Mecca and from the people of Mecca even when he was growing up and he was surrounded by, by these things and surrounded by polytheism. But uh, to be certain, the, uh, the wahi in the form of the Qur'an that came later after this incident or during this incident initially when he was 40 years of age, that is the, uh, the what we can say, al-wahi bi shara and the wahi that came that also had something of revelation or of sharia for us to follow, to emulate later on. Anything that happened before that, it would be come under the rubric of Shara Man Qablana or the Sharia of those who came before us. But with the confirmation of the Prophet of the Prophet Sallallahu then this was a, uh, a confirmed revelation and one that was supposed to be preached and promulgated amongst everyone uh, later on. So it, it is quite different from before, but we know that all of the Anbiya and Rasul are mahfuz or are preserved from sin and iniquity even before their prophethood. Uh, same question here twice is the idea of looking at the faces of the righteous in, in worship from the sayings of the Ardanat or based on explicit hadith. I can't be certain that there's explicit hadith. I'd have to research that, but I, I do know there are many of the ulama who, who mentioned it. Uh, perhaps for next week we can, uh, we can see if there is a hadith. I want to say that there is, but I'm not certain, so I'll, I'll refrain from that until I can, can ascertain. But nonetheless, the meaning, if there is or isn't, the meaning is sahih, or the, the, that. Because uh, it's not just in nadra, it's not just the look, it's what's behind the look. So if it's accompanied by compassion, it's accompanied by mercy, by respect, then these are all meanings that one should have towards one's parents or, or towards one's teachers. So more certainly, that is something that is, is uh, meritorious and commendable. Uh, in terms of Christianity that was present before the Prophet Sallallahu was given wahi, can you talk more about that in addition to waraka, the meaning with uh, uh, the monk? Yani again, uh, most of the commentators on this hadith, they mention in passing uh, about the case of waraka and the type of Christianity that he practiced. Uh, and I think at best we can say it's... Uh, 
it's thoughtful conjecture. No one can be certain exactly, but based upon what he said to the Prophet Sallallahu and based upon uh, his reaction to him, and wanting to be with him, and even even some of them said that uh, uh, Waraka died a Muslim because he clearly indicated that he would follow, or he is a follower of the Prophet Sallallahu And this was even before the Prophet Sallallahu was commanded by Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala to uh, preach, which happened in the next wahi uh, with Surah uh, Al Mudathir. Qum fa andir, qum stand fa andir. Fa andir means to so warn others, which is a command to to start the da'wah. So Waraka did not live until that time. So either he was from amongst the people of what's called uh, Al Fatra, Ahl Al Fatra, which means the people between two wahi, the people between two periods of revelation. So they are not taken into account because they didn't have a, a messenger that came and preached to them, even though he did have this initial meeting with the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu or that he actually, based upon what he knew from the Christian religion that he, he practiced, that he did affirm the uh, Nubuwa, the prophethood of the Prophet Muhammad here, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And we should also, I am not an expert on uh, the history of Christianity, but Christianity also went through uh, quite an, a number of different periods and, and developed over time. And uh, there was even great dispute early on about the divinity of Christ or, or lack thereof and so forth. And these were things that developed later on. So it's quite possible that during this early period that even that wasn't solidified or the divinity of Christ as a, uh, uh, a church uh, doctrine. Again, I, I, I can say with any certainty, but uh, it would be definitely within the realm of possibility. Did Bukhari include Mu'allaqat and weaker than Hadith narration in the chapter titles because he thought they were strong, i.e. not baseless, but didn't reach the soundness he said for the Sahih proper. That's one explanation. Also, um, sometimes he would give the, uh, the chapter heading itself would be a Hadith. And then that same hadith would be mentioned somewhere else. So he was trying to exemplify a particular point. And there are ulama who came after him who, who looked at all of the hadith of Mu'allaqa and men, the vast majority of them are sound. They uh, reach the level of siha. Uh, and also, I think it's important to mention that just because hadith is not in the strongest category doesn't mean it's to be forsaken. The hadith al-Hasan Right, which uh, arguably there's none of those in Bukhari and Muslim, but you find in the Turmidi and Ibn Majah uh, and the other six books is also a sound hadith in the sense that uh, it can it is used for deriving ahkam, for deriving uh, rulings of the Sharia. Even the daif hadith or the weak hadith is also considered to be something that. Sharia rulings can be derived from, but the nature of which Sharia rulings can be derived from the weak hadith is a matter of uh, difference of opinion between the ulama. And interestingly enough, one of the narrations or the way is based on Imam Ahmad, whose madhab is generally considered to be, or considered by many to be the more austere of the four madhab, uh, considers the da'if hadith or the weak hadith to be stronger uh, even than qiyas, than, than uh, juristic reasoning or, or juristic uh, analytical reasoning uh, in terms of its weight. Uh, and while the majority of the ulama say that the weak hadith are used for fala'il al-a'mal, which means those that exhort to good works, those that talk about uh, you know, the uh, manaqib or the, uh, the exemplary nature of some of the sahaba and others, those that uh, you know, exhort to reading uh, certain ayahs and certain surahs and things like this, uh, they generally accepted them within the, uh, the core of hadith uh, to be accepted, to be used uh, in that sense. So da'if hadith is not the same as hadith mawdu'a or fabricated hadith as we mentioned last week as I recall. Fabricated hadith is not a hadith at all. Whereas da'if hadith or weak, you know, we tend to associate the word da'if, weak, don't use it, but that's not really the case. Uh, the da'if uh, the hadith uh, we can say with uh, enough confidence that 
the Prophet Sallallahu said them, or acted, or did them, those weak hadith, uh, more than likely. But due to the precision and due to the uh, cautiousness of, or the caution of the ulama, of the, of the hadith, they categorized them according to these categories. So they were very stringent in, the, in, their, uh, in their conditions, in their shuhud. But to say that the ta'if hadith, we can't really be certain the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said it, or he probably didn't say those things, is not true. Allah Alaihi Wasallam. Bear with me here. Uh, would you have any recommendations for practical isolation today? Isolation uh, is a must, but not in a, in a physical sense, but in the spiritual sense. There should always be a detachment from the dunya uh, within one's heart. Um, the Prophet ﷺ quite clearly said, لا رهبانية في الإسلام That there's no monasticism in Islam. So it can't be taken as a, a particular uh, practice for most people, the vast majority of people, to sort of retreat to the woods or to the mountains and just stay away from people and have no interaction with them at all. Um, you know, as they say in the, the uh, al khalta ma tawfiyat al ahkam khayrun min al uzla that being amongst people ma tawfiyat al ahkam but, but by observing sharia, by observing taqwa, by acting fairly and equitably, equitably amongst people is better than being isolated, better than mm -hmm. being in an uzla or to be by oneself. But of course, being by oneself is better than to be amongst those who, where you find yourself overwhelmed by, by vice and iniquity. Allah Ala. But I think we live in a time now where it's important that each one of us who considers our, ourselves a da'i, someone who is trying to, uh, to, to show others a better way of living. And that can only happen if we are amongst them, if we are mixing with them. Uh, but to take uh, al-uzla or atikaf or as a, as a means at certain times, you know, during our day we can have certain times where we're, we're isolated. If you feel that you need to be with people all the time or, or you get edgy if you're alone, then that's an indication that there, there's some problem with, uh, with, uh, with your, your, your spirituality, that if you always have to be in contact with people. There should be times of the day where we seek out some isolation in a sense. Certain times of the day, certain times of the week, for example. Certain times uh, during the month. Certain times of the year. And even, for example, the atikaf in Ramadan is a certain time of year where there's a certain type of isolation and so forth. So it should be a regular practice, but it's not something that is a sort of MO or, or, or mode that we operate by uh, in a constant state. And it's best even if one has access to a trained uh, scholar or sheikh to guide one through that process would be the best way to do it instead of sort of trying to figure it out on your own. Uh, is there a narration of Abu Huraira that he wanted to retreat to a mountain to just worship God with the Prophet ﷺ, advised him against it? If so, which collection? I'm not familiar with such a hadith, but I would answer that in the same way that I just answered that. Um, again, there is no monasticism. Uh, Ahl Sufa, though, which Abu Huraira was part of, or the people of the bench, were sort of uh, uh, in a different uh, state than others, you know, they were living in the masjid and they were had munazima, they were with the Prophet ﷺ all the time and that allowed them to actually record many of his uh, attributes and traits and behaviors, so that actually was a big service to, to the Ummah. So I think actually I'll, uh, I'll stop here inshallah uh, until next time as we've uh,
sure people are, want to retreat and, and take a break. So I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to uh, give us uh, success and to ennoble us in the dunya and the akhirah and that he make, makes us amongst those that uh, his mercy falls upon and that he protect us and protect our families and that he give us uh, understanding of this deen and he gives us openings and that he shines uh, his light of understanding upon all of us. وَأَخْرُ دَعْوَانَا وَالْحَمْدُ لَهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ وَأَذْبُ الصَّلَامُ وَتَمَّ تَسْلِيمُ عَلَى سِيدَنَا الْحَمْدُ لَهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ وَالْسَّلَامُ عَلَيْكُمْ وَرَحْمَةُ اللَّهِ وَبَر